Good evening. Welcome to West Houston's Bible Church. I got a couple announcements before we get started. Actually, just one, because uh, you all know that Robbie's not here. So, uh, The only announcement really is the annual church picnic on Saturday, this Saturday, at 1130 to 3 p.m. at Orlando Salas' home site. The church is grilling hamburgers and hot dogs and pro providing all the fixings you need to bring the sides and the desserts, heavy on the desserts. Sign-up sheets are, and maps are, are out in the Fellowship Hall. And don't forget to bring chairs and bug spray, especially the bug spray. Uh, okay, uh, we have Dr. Ded Doug Petrovich speaking with us tonight. He's an old friend of the church here, so I am going to turn it over to you. Everyone, great to see you. Good to have you with us who are here in the flesh and you who are following us live and after the fact, too. Who knows how long this will be listened to, right? Probably long after our lifetimes are gone. Um, but it's great to be with you. Um, I always count it a thrill to be here. Uh, it was really sad for me to hear about the uh, church picnic this weekend because at 3.45 in the morning, I'm gonna, going to be waking up and getting on a plane right away in the morning, early in the morning and flying to Pennsylvania for the weekend. Otherwise, I would crash the party and eat a few of those uh, hot dogs. Uh, so I'm, I'm sad, but I'm glad for you that it's this weekend, um, and I hope it goes well. I hope it's good weather and you enjoy um, the church picnic. All right, why don't we open our time with a word of prayer, and then we will roll together. Father, thank you so much for this evening and the opportunity we have to look into your word. Thank you for the power that it has. Thank you for how the Spirit of God works together with the Word of God that he helped to orchestrate as he guided along the inspired writers. And um, Lord, thank you for how you desire to make your word come alive in our hearts. And I pray that that would happen as a result of all that we speak about tonight. Um, thank you for the privilege we have of getting together, of being part of your family, that we will be a part of the house of God and the family of God for all of eternity, both when we die and we leave this world and we're in a bodiless state uh, as we're with you, uh, and later when we all have, um, once again, a body, a resurrected body, one that will not decay or um, cause pain or age or falter because on the new earth we will be with you forever on that place in new bodies with new hearts that have been cleansed, removed forever from sin and the sin nature. Uh, we anticipate that. We look forward to it. We know that you have ordained it because you spoke about it in your word and we know that you are trustworthy, O oh God. So, um, Lord, Bless our time that we may, as a result, be a blessing to others because of it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, as you can see from my slide, rain down fire. One of my favorite stories in the entire Bible is 1 Kings 18 and the encounter between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. What an amazing set of events. So we want to walk through that story tonight together. Uh, before we do, uh, part of the title comes from a, a recent film, a 2019 film. Some of you uh, probably are familiar with the Avengers series or the franchise of films. And more or less the climax of most of those films came out in 2019, right before COVID, called Endgame. And near the end of the film, there's this final monumental battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And the evil, of course, is led by this gigantic figure called Thanos. And as he is, uh, and his army is fighting against the Avengers and, and their armies, um, he is in a predicament. Uh, one of the most powerful of the Avengers, her name is Wanda, a female character, and she's about you know, she, she's just with her powers taken off his armor, and she's just ready to, to kind of lay into him with her abilities. And uh, Thanos knows that he's in big trouble. And he has a spaceship overhead with lots of firepower. So just before she can really put the hurt on him, he calls out to his people, 
in his spaceship and says, rain, fire. And at least for a while, everything changes because of that. And they unleash this torrid amount of uh, of firepower down onto the battlefield, um, wounding both uh, the good, you know, those who were on his side and those who were on the enemy's side. He didn't care. He just wanted to be protected himself personally from the harm he was about to experience. And that's the same kind of idea in some senses um, with Elijah. He was calling on the king of kings, the god of gods, to intervene on his behalf, on behalf of the people of Israel, to rain down fire so that it could be demonstrated that God was who he says he is. So that's the story we we want to look at tonight. First, a little bit of background. Okay, it's giving me a little bit of trouble as it sometimes does at the start. There we go. There we go. Okay, now it's moving. So the background is in 1 Kings 16, verses 29 through 33. So I'm going to read you from my text here. You can follow along in your Bible if you'd like. Uh, This is my translation. You won't necessarily see it per se in one of the translations that you have. It says this, beginning in verse 29 of 1 Kings 16. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in year 38 of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, practiced evil in the sight of he who is more than all who were before him. So Ahab was one of the kings of the northern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Israel, which is comprised of the majority of the tribes. And what's fascinating about the northern kingdom is that every single king in the history of the northern kingdom is classified as an evil king. There is not one good king, one godly king among them. The southern kingdom has, uh, I forget the exact number, five or six who are considered godly, but nobody from the north. And that goes all the way back to Jeroboam the first, who took over at the time of the dividing of the kingdom. Remember, God uh, was not pleased with Solomon and and, and the evil that he embraced, which is strange because he was given such wisdom. So God promised that the kingdom would be divided, only thing is that he, God said to him, Solomon, because of David, your father, and of course that special relationship that David and God had, because of your father, I will not do it in your days, but in the days of your son. So in the reign of Rehoboam, God did that very thing and separated the kingdom. And Jeroboam the first, who was the first king of the northern kingdom, he led the tribes of Israel into horrendous evils the worst of which was idolatry and not even hiding it. For example, he built uh, temples and altars throughout Israel and especially even in the the extremities, Dan in the north and Beersheba in the south, um, he built built worship sites uh, that would worship Baal, the god of the Canaanite people. And... It just grew from there. Uh, Some kings after him were worse than he was. Some did at least what he did. Some did less than what he did. Uh, For example, he also built high places uh, along many of the cities. So many of the cities where the Israelites lived were either on or in many cases to near um, a height, uh, the top of a hill. And so at the top of the hill, that usually was the place where there would be a little... Uh, cultic worship sites set up, even in, again, these small towns. And and these are known as the high places where people could go by as they're passing through or locals and and worship one of the gods that's being worshipped in these high places. So that's another thing that Jeroboam did. Um, But this guy here, the son of Omri, Ahab, he's characterized here as not just uh, typically following suit with practicing evil, but but practicing evil in God's sight more than all who were before him. So every single wicked king before Ahab was even less wicked than he was. 
This guy is the bottom of the barrel. And we have to know that going into the story in 1 Kings 18 because it's an amazing story of what happens, uh, God versus um, the gods of the land. So verse 31 says, It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. You see how that's worded? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's just understood that he was as bad as that original evil king, Jeroboam the first that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, which means with Baal. And so the focus is on the person who is connecting himself to Baal, the Canaanite pagan deity. Um, and Ethbaal was the king of the Sidonians. Okay, So uh, another thing that God had talked about throughout uh, the uh, to Moses and what's recorded in the Pentateuch, the first five books, is the importance that if there's going to be a king, that he remain faithful to God. Uh, and as part of the danger of what, what he could do, he, if he were, were to marry a foreign wife, and especially by that, I suppose foreign isn't so much the problem as a woman who embraced foreign deities. That's the big problem. And many of the kings fell into that trap. They found beautiful women or conquered other nations or peoples or cities and took wives for themselves. You, you know the list of the hundreds of wives that David and Solomon and others had. But, um, but what this guy did is he married, again, not, not just a foreign woman, but a woman who is the son, I'm sorry, the daughter of the king of the Sidonians. And the king of the Sidonians was... Uh, intricately connected to Baal and Asherah, the consort, the female deity that, that was together with Baal. And that would easily uh, draw his heart away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's a big problem. All right, well, who are the Sidonians and where are they in all of this? Well, I have this map for you just to take a look at. So um, the land of Philistia is here, Samaria is here, and of course uh, Samaria is the centerpiece of the northern kingdom. In other words, the capital of the, ci the city of Samaria is in the midst of the, um, the area of Samaria, Samaria here in the purple. And where you see these cross bands in here, um, well, this is the heartland, if you will, of Judah. So the southern kingdom, where some of the good kings were, and then Samaria... Uh, this is the heartland of it. Um, and so um, the battle that we're going to be looking at takes place on Mount Carmel. There's a, a range of mountains. So when the Bible talks about Mount Carmel, it's not just one mountain as we would connect. You know, if we hear the name Mount Kilimanjaro or um, Mount Shasta or something, those are individual mountains, a single peak. But in Biblical times, mainly when they're talking about a mountain, it's not just one, but a range of mountains. And sure enough, there's a range of mountains here that jets out that is essentially an extension of this hill country here, what's called the Central Mountain Spine that goes more or less north and south, and it's high country. Um, that's the, um, the land, the hinterland. And, and that bows or bends that, that high land, uh, and so there, there are mountaintops that are in this range uh, in uh, the Mount Carmel area. What we know of as where the battle took place that we're going to look at is probably near the end of it here. Tradition says it was in this area, and that's we have no real reason to object to that. But where, um, where Jezebel was from is further to the north in this uh, yellow area, the land of Phoenicia. So Phoenicia consists of lots of different um, city-states, uh, two of the most important being Tyre, which is located here, that Alexander the Great, later in history, in the fourth, late in the 4th century, he overtakes after a seven-month siege against the city because it's, um, it's out um, into, the, into the actual Mediterranean Sea, and it's a very, very well-fortified city. And then Sidon, there it is right there. Sidon is the site, uh, the city from where um, Jezebel comes from. Um, <clears throat> so what is the relationship kind of coming into this time frame that the Israelites have with the kings of Phoenicia, such as the king of Tyre and the, maybe even the king of Sidon? 
So here's what it says. Here's co- just a couple blurps to, to clue us in. In 2 Samuel 5.11, it says, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, there it is, right? That city we just looked at, Tyre, on the coast, sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stone cutters. So they built a palace for David. So what David did is he, he had this amazing working relationship with Hiram, the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre provided um, both the, the tools and the, um, uh, the lumber and other uh, items that were used in the building of David's palace. So they, they developed this this trust, this relationship of trust, and had a, had a wonderful history, uh, David with the king of Sire. Um, and then in the next reign, in Solomon's reign, uh, we read about this. It says in 1 Kings 5, 1, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he had heard that they anointed him, that Solomon, as king in place of his father, because he, Siram, uh, Hiram, went on, and this is, this is the way it says in Hebrew, He went on loving David the entire time, meaning the the entire time of his reign. Isn't that beautiful? He went on loving David. Beautiful statement. And then in 1 Kings 5, 6, five verses later, it says this. um, So now command that they cut down for me cedars from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants And I will, and this is Solomon speaking to the king of of, uh, Tyre, and I will give you wages for your servants according to all that you say. So, Hiram, you tell me what kind of pay scale needs to work, and and I'll pay all of your workers whatever you say. Whatever salary you say, we'll pay. I'll give you wages for your servants according to all that you say because you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber, like the Sidonians. So Solomon was, was dropping a compliment to the Phoenicians, and he was referring to Sidon, the city just to the north. And I don't know if, if, if at this point uh, the city of Tyre was controlling Sidon, and so the king of Tyre uh, also um, oversaw Sidon. I, I'm not really sure. I haven't investigated that. But uh, certainly, certainly there would be lots of skilled laborers, especially in timber, because the mountains in Phoenicia were famously known for growing uh, up to 40 feet tall cedars, which may not sound impressive to you, especially if you've been to you know, Sequoia or Redwood, which I've, I've been to Sequoia. It's amazing. I mean, your neck hurts from looking up that high. The trees are amazing. But in the ancient world, 40 feet uh, was plenty high. And so... Uh, Constantly, there were trees being cut down, and they would float them down along the water, and they'd, they'd um, end up uh, in the southern Levant, and they'd be hoisted out, dried, and then um, they could be used for building. So um, Solomon wanted to take advantage of the skill of all of the Phoenicians in the ability to make, you know, to have amazing woodwork, and beyond that, to build buildings um, of... Uh, and it, you know, uh, an extremely high level. So that's what he did. He hired the uh, the, the king of uh, the laborers from the king of Tyre to be able to do that. So you see this relationship that's going on over time here between the Phoenicians and the Israelites. So it's no small wonder that that they remained in close contact with one another. So let's pick it back up. So he went. And he served Baal. And again, we're talking about Ahab, this this wicked king of the north who was even worse than any of his predecessors. So he went and he served Baal. And he bowed down to him. Hmm. Why would he serve Baal, though? Well, we'll look at that in a minute. Then he erected an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. So what does he do? He builds a temple in Samaria. And of course, there should be a red flag already, just with the very concept of building a temple in Samaria, right? How many temples were there supposed to be in Israel? One. And where was it supposed to be? Jerusalem. That's the only place that God sanctioned for a temple. The peoples of the ancient world, and this is really important, they had multiple temples for one God. 
in different cities, different locations. And it was fine. It was no problem. But that's not the way God wanted it to be because God wanted, to, wanted it to be indelibly imprinted on their minds that there is one God. And of course, he localized himself in one place, in one city, in one temple, that's one building, one tripartite building, in one room of the building, the innermost room, and that's the only place he lived. And he dwelled among his people. So you couldn't build temples throughout Israel. What does Ahab do? He builds a temple. You have to be kidding. Builds a temple. And even worse, he doesn't make it a temple to the God of his fathers. He makes it a temple to Baal. So his ship is truly sinking. Ahab also fashioned the Asherah. And that, of course, is that, that female deity that's the consort. It's like the wife of Baal. So you could have, you know, next to one another, you could have a statue, which is an idol, statue of Baal, and then a statuette, I guess, of, uh, of Asherah. And they, you know, coexist, and they work together, and they, you know, accomplish all that they would, would want to, according to the people that would be worshiping them. So... Um, so it wasn't enough even that he had one pagan god. Now he needed a second one. So he keeps making things worse for himself and for Israel. Because remember, he's leading as the king. He's leading his people. And it's in the wrong direction. Thus Ahab did more to provoke he who is God of Israel than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. As if you, you know... Hearing it once or writing it once wasn't enough in verse 30. Now let's repeat it again in verse 33, just so you get the point. This king was the worst of the bad. That's, that's where he was. That's, that's where the nation was. I don't know about you, but in my, well, in, in a couple years, I'll, I'll hit the 60 mark. In my almost 60 years on earth, it's as if I've seen this nation become worse and worse and worse. Uh, when I was a child, it was illegal to kill an unborn child. It happened, but it was illegal, and you could be prosecuted. But then all of a sudden, it became illegal. And now everyone is screaming because, and it wasn't even taken away, was it? It was just uh, pushed off to the states for them to decide. So you can still get an abortion. You just you know, cross state lines if you need to, but it can happen. We can kill innocent, unborn babies. We can do it in this country. Where, where are we going? Uh, the drug problem in this country is out of control. And now we have this, this master drug, fentanyl, that's working its way across the border in quantities that you can hardly even believe. And if a common drug is laced with a little bit of fentanyl, it can kill six, eight, ten people with one try. That's where we're going. Evil in this country is getting rampant and out of control. And it's being protected now by law and legislation of all things. What's next? So it really needs to be time for us to take a stand. To look at what's going on around us and say, that's not good enough. And we're not going to allow this and do whatever it takes to clean up the evil in this nation. So there needs to be a mass repentance. There needs to be a movement in another direction. There needs to be leadership that follows goodness and righteousness and truth and honor and integrity and protection of life and law, real law. The country is crying out for it just like Israel was in that day. The god Baal, 
affectionately known as the storm god in the Levant. And of course, the Levant is the area that consists of the southern Levant is ancient Canaan slash Israel, and the north of it is the, the northern Levant, that's Phoenicia and Syria above it, and to the, a little bit to the east, a ways to the east, all the way to the Euphrates, technically. Um, so in the Levant, this deity, Baal, became a very powerful deity, especially by the end of the second millennium B.C. So by 1,000 B.C. and, and after 1,000 B.C., Baal had risen above. Early on in the early part of the second millennium B.C., um, El, the king of the gods, pretty much had the, the supremacy, but Baal came along, um, and especially with the aspects of Baal's um, qualities that he, that he exhibited, um, that, that he became uh, a god who was more enticing to kind of put at the top of the list. So he became essentially the most port, important god in the pantheon. And even at um, Ugarit, where, where, um, where texts called him the storm gods at Ugarit and Tyre and Sidon and, and throughout Phoenicia, um, they identify, they connected Baal with the earlier El, the king of the gods. And remember, uh, if, you were, if you were here with me you know, a year or so ago, I, I told you about El and how the, is, the early Israelites used the name El to speak of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they borrowed this concept from the people of the, of the land, of the Levant, the Canaanites and, and the other people, who, who named the king of the gods, El. Moses uses it in the Pentateuch. Whether you like it or not, it's there, okay? He uses it. But he's not connecting it with their pagan god. He's taking the concept out of the pagan god, which is the concept of the king of the gods, and he's connecting it to the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so that the people around him can see and understand. It's kind of like Paul at Mars Hill, right? Where he, he saw this inscription where it said, to an unknown god, and he tried to connect that with, with um, the god of, of, uh, uh, of the Bible and... and and the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now the risen Savior. And he, he tried to get the people there at Athens to understand that that unknown God is the God that's uh, the one who, um, who, who called Israel out from all the peoples as his chosen nation. So, um, so that's the, um, the extent of... Uh, a little bit of, of Baal's involvement with um, the peoples of the Levant. He was also the god of wind, rain, lightning, and thunder. So everything associated with, with storms, it was all part of what he became sovereign over. You can see the picture here uh, to the right especially, on both actually, but uh, this here, this looks like, I don't know, a, maybe a tree with with not many roots there, but that's actually a thunderbolt. So he's depicted in the iconography of the ancient world as, as carrying a thunderbolt, kind of like Zeus, if you're familiar with Greek mythology. He's running around firing uh, thunderbolts. So that's Baal. Uh, he's the one who brings about storms and rain. Um, so he's responsible also ultimately for fertility via rainfall. So it's, it's kind of like a thing where, you know, there's this, this symbiotic relationship between him and, and Asherah. Um, she is also connected to fertility. So the worship of Asherah and the ways that they worshiped, the, the pagan people worshiped her, um, it, it kind of worked together to, to draw upon or to, to persuade, that was their thought, uh, Baal, to act on their behalf, to do what they would call him to do, which was essentially bring rain. Because remember, the land of Israel, is, it's not like Egypt that has the Nile River. It's not like Mesopotamia that has the Tigris and the Euphrates. For people to live, they need water for their crops, don't they? And for their animals. But in the Levant, you're not getting water in almost any place unless it rains. So that was a, a, a place that was dependent upon clouds that would bring water with them. So fertility is connected with the swarm god. Baal resided in the underworld in summer. Summer, of course, is the time when there's really no, uh, there's no rain. And there's no, 
there's a relentless heat and no break from it. That's what life is like. And if you've ever been over there in the land of Israel in the summer, it's vicious. It is day after day of 100 degrees or so and no rest for the weary. Imagine that. And then, of course, the Phoenicians, um, yes, identified Baal with El. So that's Baal. Here are a couple images of, um, and she goes by a lot of names. She started, I assume, in Mesopotamia as Ishtar. She's known as the Morning Star. She was worshipped by the Akkadians and the Sumerians uh, by a different name. And um, she was connected with a lot of important parts of society and life. Uh, one of which was, and of course, I, I did make this PG for you. Um, she, she was the goddess of love. She was also the goddess of war. So go figure that one, right? How can you be the goddess of love and then the goddess of war? But she is. She's the goddess of both. So that's uh, Asherah. Um, or that's Ishtar, as she's known there. And then as she works her way into the Levant, and the people of the Levant are worshiping her, she's known as Ashtarta there, and the Israelites know her as Asherah. Um, in Egypt, and you can see on the left here, she was known as Hathor, and she has a much different hairstyle, if you can tell. She kind of has a 1960s hairstyle, I would say. I don't know if you would date it when I do. Um, and notice the bovine ears. Uh, Hathor is connected with a female, well, how many male cows are there? Uh, she's connected with the cow. She's the bovine goddess, so she's often depicted as a cow. That's the ancient world. But when she has mostly human characteristics like here, you can see that she's made to look sort of beautiful. Um, and and notice, notice how she is uh, bearing objects in her hands and arms just like uh, Ishtar from originally the um, Mesopotamia and in this picture um, and, and a piece of iconography that was made uh, by, the, by the Canaanites in the ancient uh, Levant. So um, there were cultic sites for her at Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre. Remember what we talked about or what the text talked about? Um, how she came, you know, she came as the daughter from the king of the Sidonians where they had uh, the worship of Asherah. So they would have been worshiping Baal and Asherah together. Not every city did this, but many of them did, and that would have been one of the cities. So what would she have done? She would have brought her religion with her once she married King Ahab. Whew. Bad news. She was bad news. And she gave a full... Uh, dose of this pagan worship upon her arrival. And Ahab bought it lock, stock, and barrel. Probably at her request, he built that altar in the site of Samaria, the capital city. So that's what he did. And he found himself in all kinds of trouble. Well, I want you to know that, that this wasn't something, this, you know, the worship for the Israelites to fall into this worship of pagan gods. It wasn't something new or different or surprising. Um, it was long practiced. Uh, this is one of the inscriptions from my first book that, um, uh, that uh, I represent in, in, in the book. And it's... Uh, it's Sinai 345b, so there's a Sinai 345a, which is the other side of this uh, votive sphinx, um, and it's written on either side, and on this side it says, my wealth is the strength of the lady. And the word is actually right here, the lady. It's b, and that's a guttural con uh, vowel that you don't pronounce. That's a l, and that's a t. B, l, t, you know, ba'alat, ba'alat, is the feminine version of Baal. So she was called the She-Baal, if you will, and worshipped as such by the Israelites. This is an Israelite inscription from just before the Exodus, anywhere between roughly 1480 or so, maybe a little earlier, but all the way down to 40, 1446. So that date is not a certain date, but in that range. So the Israelites, folks, that's the bottom line, were already worshipping her in Egypt, 
which is exactly what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel, well, what God says, what's recorded in the book of Ezekiel, God refers to how the Israelites worshipped idols even while they were in Egypt. And there it is. There's the proof in the pudding. They wrote it themselves. And if that's not enough, how about this one? Sinai 346a says this, the apostate, and again, this is an Israelite writing, the apostate, one who turns from the faith, whatever the faith is, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they are um, orthodox, that they're following uh, the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the apostate has regarded his pasture lightly because of possessions offered up to the lady. So what I'm suggesting, the meaning, the interpretation is here, there's an Israelite who writes this, who sees one or more other Israelites out there. And what they're doing, those other Israelites, what they're doing is they're not, giving the proper sacrifices, not, not to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to Baalat. In other words, he's scolding the Israelites for not giving her the kind of, of sacrifices that she deserves. Can you imagine that? Being scolded for not being pagan enough. That's what was going on. It's right there, okay? I didn't make it up. That's how it was written. And then this inscription, the last one. As if that wasn't enough, this Baalat worship, this, this Asherah worship going on before they even uh, get out of Egypt. He, and that is the king, sought occasion to cut away to barrenness, our great number. And, and what you need to connect this with is the edict that the king of Egypt gave for the male children to be killed by the Egyptians, upon sight. Once, once you have a newborn boy born, take him out, throw him in the Nile, end his life. He sought occasion to cut away to barrenness, our great number, right? Remember the beginning of Exodus? It says that the Israelites were growing like weeds, you know, my term weeds. They're just multiplying, you know, rabbits. Our swelling without measure. They yearned for Hathor. Ha ha, how's that? The Israelites watched what the Egyptians were doing by throwing their baby boys into the river to die. And you know what they did? They cried out to a female pagan deity. That was their response. Ah! But the quiver of our brothers was thoroughly despised, right? The quiver, that's the, that's the imagery for lots of children. So we're taking away arrows from the quiver. We're, take, we're taking out babies. That's what's going on. So he, the king, performed terror against their quiver and brought about a cry of wailing. That's exactly what's going on here. It's a documentation by an ancient Israelite before the Exodus to recount this terrible evil that the Israelites are experiencing. And folks, ha, guess why they experienced it? Guess why? Because they had turned their hearts from God. And that was an act of judgment. It wasn't just an arbitrary, uh, negative, vicious, secular, wild idea that the Egyptian king came up with. It was God's way to scold his people, Israel, for their sins and turning away from him. If you don't believe me, read Exodus 20. I'm sorry, Ezekiel 20. Read Ezekiel 20, and you'll see. That's exactly what's going on. That's the reason. So, they have this long relationship. Now we get into the text. Is it 7.30 yet? No? All right, a lot of ground to cover. Now it happened, so 1 Kings 18, 1 to 8. Now it happened after many days that the word of he who is, and that's the covenant name of God, came to Elijah in year three, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Now, you have to know, uh, I left this out of the context, between what we, the text we looked at before and this one, um, and again, it's because of the, the faithlessness of the people, it's because of the idolatry of the people, God brought about a famine. And that's no surprise, is it? Isn't that what he told Moses? If the people turn from me, what will I do? I will make the sky like iron. Iron is unbudgeable. 
nothing is going to squeeze out. You, okay, you can squeeze a lot out of a lemon, out of an orange, but iron, nothing. So it was a famine. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Huh. As if they didn't deserve it. Hello. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over his household. Oh, by the way, let me stop and pause. This is really important. What we need to do, corporately and individually, is take an inventory and ask, where are we at? We already saw where Ahab was, haven't we? We've seen enough from Ahab. He committed sins worse than any of the kings before him, and he led people into those sins. He married a pagan woman who was not just an ordinary pagan woman, but the daughter of a king who worshipped pagan gods. And he built an altar in the capital city to those pagan gods, one of those pagan gods. Um, and he multiplied the sins of Jeroboam, the first king of the dynasty, and and did everything he did as well as much worse. So that's where Ahab was. So where is each one of us today? And hopefully none of us would fall into that category where Ahab is. But there are some other characters here whose lives we need to, to kind of take a look at and essentially hold up against our face as a mirror and see where we stand and whom we are like. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over his household. So this man named Obadiah, which is prob probably, it's thought by most scholars, not to be the same Obadiah who writes a book later who's a prophet. But this guy, he is a steward. He is the head of the household for the king. So every king and just about every ancient um, city-state or nation had somebody who oversaw his property and his um, wealth that, you know, when he conquered cities or when, when other uh, nations or kings gave him tribute to collect all those things, you know, make an inventory list, store it all, make sure it's protected under, under security and, you know, all of that and, and have a, a, a full running total of everything that belongs to the king. That's part of what the steward will do, the head of the household. So Ahab had one of those people who was over his household. That's a guy named Obadiah. And then there's a parenthetical thought that's inserted into the text. And I put parentheses here to mark it off. And here's the parenthetical thought. Now, Obadiah feared he who is greatly. That sounds good, doesn't it? He fears the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob greatly. Great start. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. Yeah, because when Jezebel cut down the prophets of he who is, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by 50, so two groups of 50, in a cave and provided them with bread and water. So essentially, he was uh, acting dangerously behind the back of the king, taking a risk. Why? Because he didn't want to see the, the prophets of God lose their lives. And what, what this could remind you of is the, uh, the midwives in the days of Moses, right? They didn't want to allow this evil to happen where the babies were, were being thrown into the river to be killed. So they would find ways, they would manipulate situations to make sure that the Hebrew boys weren't being killed. And they were honored by God and Moses both for it, weren't they? They were honored because they feared God, and they knew God didn't want the babies to be killed. Where are we today? Where is our country today? Who's, who's standing up for our babies? We need people who will rise up and take the baton and say, this will not happen anymore. We will stop this evil. That's why our nation is spiraling out of control. One of the reasons So that was Obadiah. But that's not the whole story, and that's not the whole picture we get of what he is exactly like. We get more. Then, verse 5, Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all of the springs of water and to all of the valleys, 
perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So that's Ahab's strategy. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went the other way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on the road, notice, Elijah met him. And he, that is Obadiah, recognized Elijah and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, It is I. Go, say to your master. Notice, Elijah is here. So Elijah the prophet was encountered by Obadiah. And Obad Obadiah knew this is a problem because the king has been looking for him. And Elijah instructs Obadiah to leave and to go to the king and let him know that Elijah is here. So what's the response of Obadiah and what does that show about where he's at spiritually? Verse 9, he, that is Obadiah, said, What sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? As he who is your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. So when they said, he is not here, he, that is King Ahab, made the kingdom or the nation swear that they could not find you. And yet now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about when I leave that you, or when I leave you, that the spirit of he who is will carry you where I do not know. You're going to leave, Elijah. God's going to move you away to protect you. And then it's going to be trouble for me. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he doesn't find you, he will kill me, although I, your servant. Uh, and, and here's where he makes an advertisement, right? Here's what you need to know about me, Elijah. I'm this kind of person, right? Although I, your servant, have feared he who is from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of he who is, that I hid 100 prophets of he who is by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? Yet now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. Elijah said, as he who is of armies lives before whom I stand, surely I will show myself to him today. What was Obadiah's focus? It's 100% in one direction. Two thumbs pointing inward. Me. What about me? Here's what's going to happen to me. Forget about what Ahab is doing to deceive the entire nation of people, of the Israelites. For, forget about the harm that he's causing. Forget about how he's pulling people away from God. And and that needs to be the, you know, what makes the fire alarm go off. No, that's not, that's not an issue. What about me? What's going to happen to me when the king looks for you? I, I tell him that you're found, but you're gone. Then I'm in trouble. I will be killed. Way too many eyes in that narrative. So, hmm, where are we today if we were to do an inventory of ourselves? Maybe we have a great starting point, right? From our youth, we feared God. But somehow, we got off track, and now it's no longer about God, but it's about me. That's a dangerous place to be. Verse 16, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab, went, um, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Right? Isn't that a great line? Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He was probably wagging his finger at Elijah. You're the guy I've been looking for. This brought all kinds of trouble because you're trying to stop everything I'm doing. This whole campaign to promote Baalism, you're throwing a wrench into my gear. You, you're the troubler. So he, Elijah said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. How about that? How about that? What is, what is Elijah like here? He is rebuking the king. 
Think about that for a minute. What if you were to stand before the leader of this nation and rebuke him? What would happen? Would you have the guts, if you're standing in front of him, to rebuke him? Would I? Not many of us would. This guy, Elijah, he's of a different breed. If there's any one human being in this story who's an, um, an amazing role model for us to follow, it's Elijah. You already saw it with the strength that he spoke, right? That he followed God's word and he spoke to, to Obadiah with confidence and boldness. And now he stands up against the king. Wow. But it gets even better. So, um, and then he says, and you have followed the Baals, right? So it's Baal and Baalat. There's two of them right there. I don't know if there's more. I'm not aware of more. Verse 19, now, uh, now then, send and gather to me all of Israel at Mount Carmel. Remember we saw it on the map, that, that promontory that jetted off to the west, northwest, um, along the coast? together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Remember her? That wicked foreign wife that's responsible for this mess, humanly speaking. So Ahab sent a message among all of the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Wow, what an idea, right? And we, we have to think that God is the one who gave it the idea to Elijah, to bring all of Israel together. Imagine that. Imagine if this whole country, every human being in the United States of America came to one place, okay? Now, there would be a huge problem with eating and facilities and all kinds of other things, right? But imagine if everyone was brought together for some greater purpose, to one place to hash out an issue that needs to be solved. That's what happened. God collected the entire nation, so the entire Israelite kingdom came together and, and was there to watch the spectacle of what was about to take place. Verse 21, Elijah came near to all the people and he said this, and this really needs to hit home with us. How long will you hesitate? between two positions. How long? How long will you hesitate between two positions? Maybe you're not exactly where Obadiah is. Maybe you're, hopefully you're not where Ahab is. Maybe you're not quite where, where Elijah is either, but are you at the place in life where you are hesitating between two positions? I remember high school. Oh, my goodness. High school was the toughest time for me. I loved it. I loved high school. Um, had friends in all the different groups, right? I had friends among the jocks and the, um, the popular people and what we're calling that day the burnouts and, you know, the, the, the um, nerds. In every group, I had friends, right? Um, but I was a young Christian who came to the Lord in junior high. And you know what I did? I did this. I hesitated between two positions because I had the former life with all my friends, right? And we did crazy things. And I, I still loved doing that after I became a believer. And yet the other side of me and at other times I was walking with God. So I was schizophrenic. I was living the best of two worlds and I was hesitating between two positions. And if any of you know what that's like, you know that's an place of agony to be there. If any of you is in that place where you are hesitating between two positions, I have news for you. The hour has come. You need to pick a side. Pick a side. Get out of the misery and pick a side. One side or the other, pick. Choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. When you do inventory and you see this is where you're at, you're, you're straddling a fence. Choose. Put all the pros and cons on both sides if you want, but make a choice. Don't hesitate between two positions. If he who is is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Huh. What did the people do? Yet the people did not answer him a word. 
Wow. Guilt. But the lack of the backbone and the will to take a stand. They could have took, taken a stand that very moment, but they didn't. The longer you wait, the more trouble you may be in. The harder it will be to make the right decision when you're sitting on the fence. Don't hesitate. Choose. Choose. Get off that fence. Then Elijah said to the people, Ha ha. Pause. He said this, I alone am left a prophet of he who is. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. And add to that the 400 prophets of Asherah. It's 850 against one. Imagine the odds you would have, right? You go to Vegas and you lay down a bet, 850 to one. You know, which side are you picking in the game? Are you picking the Baalites or are you picking Elijah? The odds are with the multitude of prophets, folks. That, that's where the odds are. 850 to 1? I'll take those odds any day. So what happened? Now, let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood but put no fire under it. So the God needed to light the sacrifice on fire without a fire to light it. That's, that's the deal. Now, I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call in the name of your God, and I will call in the name of he who is. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Isn't that a great idea? The one who is truly God will have the power to, to inject fire from thin air onto that sacrifice. Obviously, if, if he is all-powerful, if he, whoever is the king of the gods, and remember, that's what Baal is, isn't he? To the Phoenicians, he's the king of the gods. If he's truly the king of the gods, he can do this. So all the people said, that's a good idea. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your god, and put no fire under it. <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? I love watching Olympic sports. Uh, one of my favorite young athletes is, um, what's her name? She's, she's a sprinter, 400 uh, meter hurdles. Sydney, can't think of her last name. I'll try to think of it. Um, she's the Olympic champion now, the world record holder. Imagine if she was going to start a world-class race with other world-class competitors. And she says to them, okay, I'll give you 10 seconds on me. You can go first, and I'll wait, and I'll just count off 10 seconds. Can you imagine if she does that? She's not going to win the race in a 400 meters if she gives them the advantage. But that's what Elijah did. He gave the advantage to Baal, because if Baal was powerful enough to do this, then it's all solved, and they win. The 850 win against the one. Smart. Then they took the ox that was given to them and they prepared it, verse 26, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. Yet there was no voice and no one answered. Then they jumped around th that altar that they had made, right? They're jumping up and down. You know, you've seen it in movies or whatever with... with that form of animistic worship. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, call out with a loud voice because he is, because he is a God, right? So this is, this is um, criticism. This is um, demonstrating the, the, uh, the foolishness of, of this worship of Baal. Either he is occupied or he's stepped away Right? He's out of the office for a minute. Or he's on a journey. He traveled somewhere so he can't hear you. He's gone. He's in a different time zone. Or perhaps he's asleep and he needs to be awakened. So go wake him up and then once he's awake, ask him to send fire. And he'll do it. So they screamed with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood poured out on them. 
When midday was passed, they ranted until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. Think about this for a minute, folks. This isn't just one prophet standing up there, you know, going berserk with blades and whatever else and cutting himself. This is 850 prophets. Wow! What a scene! And the people were watching everything happen and unfolding in front of them. When midday was passed, yeah, they ranted until the time of the evening off sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered and no one paid attention. Verse 30, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come close to me. So all of the people huddled up and came close to where Elijah was. And he had to do some repair work because of the, the, the rantings of the 850 prophets. So he had to rebuild his altar and put his sacrifice back on it. Um, and he fixed the altar of he who is that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones. Let's jump to verse 32. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of he who is. And he made a trench around the altar. Right? So he cut, he gouged out a trench along, uh, you know, a circumference around that altar. And um, he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers full of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. So they did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. So they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. So there's water everywhere, folks, okay? Um, once everything is soaking with water, how, how can something burn? I mean, have you ever been on uh, a camping trip, and you, know, you, need to, you need to start a fire, but it's been raining the whole time, and it makes your wood all waterlogged, you have no chance of making a fire. You're in you know, deep trouble. You better hope you have some way of protecting yourself from the elements because fire won't do it. Wood, wet wood, you know, or wood with water doesn't mix. The water flowed around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. Then at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said this, and he spoke to God, and ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most powerful prayers ever uttered, at least in recorded history. This is one of the most amazing prayers you could ever see someone pray. Look at the focus. Oh, he who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So clearly, he's calling on the God of the Israelites. Today, let it be known that you are God in Israel. You know what he says first? The most important thing. The most important thing. His, his first request. I want the people to know that you are the God of Israel. Isn't that powerful? That's what I want. That, that's what I'm consumed with. I'm not consumed with, like Obadiah, th that my life's going to be spared. How am I going to survive against these 850 prophets? He's not worried about himself. Okay? Remember, the math is against him. He, Elijah, not in the equation. God, he's in the equation. The people of Israel, they're in the equation. What does he do? He forgets about himself. If we're going to do inventory and look at ourselves, we need to ask the question, are we so enamored with ourselves that we're forgetting about God? Are, are we so focused about whatever it is, uh, the necessities of life, making money? Um, are, are we obsessed with vacations and getting away? Are we obsessed with, with the things of, that provide enjoyment? such as boats or motorcycles or whatever, or with fixing up and getting a new house or a, a house that we've always wanted or, you know, all of the different things that could consume us, that the enemy wants to, to have us make as 
our focal point. If we've let anything or anyone take the place that belongs to God alone, we've already lost. We're done. We're sunk. Our ship is on the way down to the bottom of the ocean. Can't be about us. Can't be about me. I I have no idea how I'm going to make it through retirement. Financially, no idea. No idea. None whatsoever. Not ready. Okay? It's month to month. Who cares? Who cares? Now, don't tell my wife I said that, okay? I'll be in big trouble. But who cares? All I need is God. And all I need to do is make my life about Him. And if I make my life about Him, do you think He'll forget about me? No. No. Jesus said, my Heavenly Father knows about all of your needs. Every one of them. Don't worry. He takes care of the sparrow. You think He's not going to take care of you? Of course He will. I need to be consumed with every man, woman, and child knowing that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of this nation and the God of this world and the God who created this universe. That's what I need to do. That's what I need to be about. Everything else doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It'll all fall into place if I put that first. Where are you? And, and this is great, I love this, right? There, there's so much false humility in our country. And that I am your servant. No, 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 no. It wasn't, he wasn't saying, Lord, put Elijah on the billboards. No, that's not what he was saying at all. He was saying, first, I want them to know that you are their God. And second, I want them to know that I belong to you and that you sent me. I'm your servant. They need to know that I'm your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. How many people want to go public with the kind of commitment to God and to Christ that will get you in trouble? Are you ready? Are you ready to make a stand? We've got to. We can't be afraid. We've got to make those stands. Put it on the line. What did Jesus say? He said this, Luke 9, 26, because whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. When he comes in glory, in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. If, if, we, are afraid, if we are ashamed of Jesus in front of people, Jesus is going to be afraid, ashamed of us. We've got to stand up. We need for people to know that we belong to God. H- however that works out. I, I don't know. F- for, that has to be an individual thing for you. I'm not telling you how to do that. But you need to get it under control. You, you need to put yourself out there. You need to take a stand. You need to want people to know that you belong to God. Lord, they need to know that I'm your servant. And folks, you don't need to be afraid of it because people need to see you take a stand for him. And that will help them to know it's worth putting my faith and hope in God. Because here's a person who's put it all on the line, believing that God is real. Answer me, O he who is. Answer me, that this people may know that you, O he who is, are God. And that you have turned their heart back again. What a prayer. Lord, help each one of us to be like Elijah at this moment, to pray such powerful prayers, to make it about God, to connect ourselves with him so that we would be seen as God's servant, and asking God to do the impossible, to do great things, to demonstrate his power, and that he is is who he says he is in the Bible. Then what happened? The fire of he who is fell and consumed the offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. The water, all that water that made sure that the, that the sacrifice couldn't burn, it licked it up. The fire ate it up. Fire conquered water unlike it's supposed to happen. When all the people saw this, right, their eyes, can you imagine how big their eyes got? 
They fell on their faces and they said, he who is, he is God. He who is, he is God. Right? Finally, finally. What did Jesus say to Thomas? You have seen and believed. Blessed are those who believed but have not seen. They're even more blessed because they took it by faith. The people here, they needed to see it. They hesitated between two positions. God wants to test your faith. Do you really believe? And he will. He'll test you over and over and over. What's, your, what's going to be your response? Do you need to see it first? Do you need to see the scars in Jesus' wrists first to believe? No. Do it without seeing that God would see it and recognize your faith and reckon it to you as righteousness. That's what God wants. Inventory. Take inventory. Where are we? Then Elijah said, to close up the story, seize the prophets of Baal, right? Put a rope around them. Pull them in. Bring them together. And they went down the mountain, by the way, uh, the hilltop of Mount Carmel. And he says, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. You want to know how holy God is? Those prophets of a pagan God who opposed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had to forfeit their own lives because they made the decision to follow the wrong God. That is the danger that you face when you turn your back on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't do it. Don't turn your back on him. Turn your back on everything else if you need to, but not him. And he will exalt you in due time. What did Elijah do? Lord, rain down fire. Rain down fire so that you can show everyone who you are. And while you're doing it, help them to see that I'm your man or I'm your woman in the process. May, may we be like Elijah here to demonstrate the power of God to the people of God and all who don't know him yet so that they can bow their hearts in submission to the God of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this unbelievable story. True story, true event, what happened in the ninth century B.C. Because you were concerned about your people who turned their backs on you and ran after a lifeless God. Father, some of us may be like Obadiah here, or some of us may be like uh, King Ahab here, who we are running away from you full bore, a hundred miles an hour, opposing you at every turn, erecting our own gods, following our own hearts, uh, seeking the, the pleasure of the flesh. Lord, whatever it is, if that's where we are, help us to do business with you today. Not wait a day, not hesitate at all. Or like, Lord, we may be like Obadiah, who feared you from the beginning and walked with you, but eventually somehow didn't catch every, on to everything and made it more about him than about you. If that's where we are, Lord, help us to bow and submit to you and ask for forgiveness that you might grant it and that we might walk with you in a closer way. Or Lord, we may be like the people who are hesitating between two positions, not knowing if we're going to follow you or follow something else or someone else or some other love as, as our first pursuit. If that's where we are, Lord, help us to do business today, right now, to stop what we're doing and do business. 
Or Lord, if we're not like Elijah already, let that be our standard as he was at this time where he heard your word, he hearkened to it, he embraced himself uh, with it, and he followed your word at whatever expense it took, at whatever risk it took. We have no idea what that would be like to stand up against 850 hostile people who are completely against where we are and what we believe. But Lord, give us the courage that wherever you put us, no matter how many people in that place oppose you, that we would stand up boldly like Elijah and that we would call on you to help the people around us know who you are And that we would expect you to make them know that we are your person for your glory. Father, answer these prayers. Answer them and go above and beyond for the glory of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.